It's Friday night, it's almost live, and it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's News Thing. Joining Sam on the show, given five stars by God himself in his Daily Express column, Christ on a Bike, it's Vanessa Feltz. Ganesh in a Vauxhall, it's Rod Little. Mohammed on a jet ski, it's Felicity Ward. Coming up tonight, Calais, what's the French for stop burning my tent, s'il vous plaît? Great news, Britain's run out of schools. Northern powerhouse, northern shithouse more like, how the Tories are letting the North rot in hell. And it's king of the spinners, the jungle VIP. And he wants the secret of man's red fire. It's special guest, Mr. Alistair Campbell. Hello and welcome to Sam Delaney's News Thing. Thanks for joining me, panel. OK, uh, right, Calais. Quick recap as I see it. There was a massive war in Syria. We dropped a load of bombs on it. ISIS started beheading people all over the place, so loads of them ran off in search of a more welcoming, tolerant country. And somehow, they wound up in France. And they've been there ever since, living under tarpaulin on the off chance of getting across the channel to the UK. For nine months, the whole of Europe has been staring gormously at the jungle in Calais, trying to work out what to do about it. And they finally come up with a solution. They're going to smash the shit out of the place. Part of the problem is we don't get on with the French. Us and the French are like a divorced couple arguing about custody of the kids. Neither side wants them. Of course they don't. Kids are a pain in the ass. The migrants in Calais are just like kids. They're noisy, they smell, they've always got their hands out for something, and some of them shit in swimming pools. Remember, all the people in the jungle have been offered asylum in France, but they'd rather live in a shanty town made of rubbish with only a sliver of hope of getting to the UK than stay where they are. A lot of people, bastards I call them, are worried that the reason those immigrants are keen to get here is so they can get their benefits and a free operation on the NHS. And maybe that's true. Maybe they have heard that sort of thing is accessible here. But let's not do ourselves down. There's more to this country than family tax credits and free AIDS medicine. When you see those pictures of city centres on a Saturday night with people pissed out of their minds lying in the gutter, that's not a picture of a broken society. It's quite the opposite. It's a depiction of a people so chuffed they're born British that they go out every Friday night of the year and sometimes even Thursdays and celebrate like it was New Year's fucking Eve. I'll tell you what, if the jungle did get moved to Kent, it wouldn't look anything like the one in France. We would at least treat refugee families with a certain amount of respect and dignity. And that's my personal guarantee to you, the migrants of the world. Come here and we'll treat you right. Although, just to be clear, as it stands, we are not letting any more of you in, so it's a moot point. Uh, Rod Liddle, uh, other than when my mate Shitty Paul burnt down his nail bar in Brentford for the insurance, when has setting fire to a problem ever worked? It doesn't usually work. I mean, the reason they're there, the question you asked, mm. is because the French are horrible to them. Mm. And they're really horrible to them. Mm. I mean, we think we're horrible by not letting them in. But in France, they want to get out of France because the French are so utterly, unspeakably vile all the time to them. Just the same as they would be to us if we were in France. Yeah. I mean, they are vile people. Angela <laughs> Merkel has just turned Europe into a massive game of total wipeout, hasn't she? You know, it's like she announced... It was like a Facebook party that got out of hand. She announced <laughs> it and, like, literally everyone from all over the world turned out, and now she doesn't know how to take back control. Well, that's it. Because of the migrant crisis, we're having this referendum on whether mm. we should mm. stay or leave. There won't be an EU. The charity that went down to Calais and had a look around and it'd been, it'd been looking after Calais for ages, and the, the, finally the boss of the charity goes down there, has a look around and says... Oh, fuck this. None of this lot are refugees. They're all migrants, all of them economic migrants. That, it makes no sense to have them staying in a shanty town there. The reason they're coming here is because they want, they do want, as stuff. a bastard, they stuff. They want our stuff. They want our stuff, yeah. To be and fair. I don't blame yes, them Is that for true? Do they just want our wonderful, I'm, wonderful but things? I'm, I'm all about the boss of Ikea who said we've reached peak stuff. Mm. So surely, yes, you know, true. we've got peak stuff, so maybe we've got have some a bit of stuff they could have. Yeah. Felicity, Australia, your country, uses a point-based system for letting in migrants. Is that reasonable and fair, or is it Australia's biggest affront to human dignity since the music career of Stefan Dennis? I mean, that was a rough period for us. That was bleak. We call that the dark ages. Mm. Um, but actually what we do is anyone who comes by boat is we go out in the ocean and we turn them around and we take them back uh, into someone else's waters. And so people are still dying. And actually our government uh, border force, they're called, 
pa are paying smugglers. They're not they're still dying. They're dying. They're, not they're dying. Still they're dying. Now a, they're in no, a concentration wait, wait a camp. Sec, wait a sec. They're dying at a rate of round about 10% of what was happening when we had bleeding heart imbeciles oh like yourself saying, come, come to our country. So, so they're getting okay. their inflatable tyre, halfway through, Sharky comes along, are dead. The more people you rescue, the more people will come, the more people will die. We haven't solved this one. Let them drown, so says Rod Liddle. Oh. No, I uh, didn't. <laughs> Stop them coming. <laughs> now, Bobby Mayer investigates the badger cull, living in a hole, eating grubs, covered in ticks and spreading TB to cattle. There's a 1% chance one of these puppies has rabies. We're gonna have to kill them all. Like typhoid Mary of the animal kingdom, badgers are a silent TB carrier. But the problem is the government doesn't just kill badgers with TB, they shoot them all. You can't kill something because it might be infected. If you could, with all the places I've woke up naked, I'd just be pumped full of AIDS medication. Just leave the badgers alone. They'll get run over by a car eventually. A couple years ago, I got into trouble when I painted some homeless guys up as badgers and paid them a fiver to run across the A40. I interviewed Environment Secretary Liz Truss to ask her why this is happening. The public are very, very interested in environmental issues. They're interested in trees, in forestry, interested in bees. They're interested in Michael Buble and The One Show. The public are fucking idiots. Why are you murdering the badgers? That is something that I receive advice from scientific experts on. My role as environment And if your scientific experts told you putting batteries up your asshole would auto-tune your farts, would you do it? I'm tired of you. Go away. This country has a violent history with the badger. Traditionally, it was believed that a badger claw hung around the neck gave the wearer the ability to keep secrets, which I think is fucked up. If I saw someone with a dead animal's foot around their neck, I'd cross the street, not tell them about the time I sniffed my cousin's hair. But I like badgers a little too much, as last year's unfortunate business proved. The stand-up comedian Bobby Mayer appeared in court today, charged with carrying out an obscene act in the presence of badgers. Are you filthy? Are you dirty? I am. I'm a dirty badger. Farmers, I get it. A TB outbreak can destroy your herd and make it hard for you to feed your family. But cow farts are one of the leading causes of global warming, and if after hundreds of years they haven't developed an immunity to this disease, fuck them. Farm badgers, they're tough, resilient, and to celebrate this new livestock, Liz Truss can milk one with her teeth. Powerful stuff there, Bobby. Now, have you ever been to the north of England? I have, it's lovely. Bad news though, because it might not be here for much longer. The government have decided to let it go. This week, a report revealed 10 of the 12 most struggling cities are in the north. So much for George Osborne and his northern powerhouse. As we know, local government budgets have been cut to the bone over the last few years. The government did give £5 billion worth of emergency funding, but almost all of it went to Tory-controlled shires in the south, Cameron using the funding to buy off Tories who were threatening to revolt. Meanwhile, places like Liverpool have been left on their arse. What's more of a disproportionate number of the migrants we do let in have been sent up to stone-broke regions of the north, while in parts of the rich south, like Oxfordshire, where the Camerons live, there are literally none. None at all. I mean, who cleans the scullery and fucks the master when the mistress is in town? Uh, Vanessa, I remember the days being at football matches and we all used to wave £20 notes at Scousers to taunt them. And there was a big <laughs> north-south divide. But it seems like those days are back, do you think? No, not really. I, I, I'm northern by penetration. I married a Mancunian. <laughs> I mean, it was a mistake in every possible way, except for the Mancunian bit, which was actually a right lark. You must do lots of gigs in the north. It's no more friendly than down here, is it? It's way friendlier. I'm so sorry, it really is. There's lots of places I haven't been, though, but when I was looking at the list, there's some of them, like, is it Rochdale? Rockdale? Rochdale, yeah. Rochdale. I mean, they haven't had great PR lately. There's been some issues Tough, yeah. in the area. That's a hard sell. Grimsby is a movie that's come out um, yeah. mocking yeah. Uh, the working class people of that, that town. Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, Oxbridge Educated, 
Uh, Public is school man, is, is the man. Hang on a minute, not true it. at all. He was at Haberdashers with me. This film is coming in for a lot of criticism because it's a patronising. It's it meant to be humorous. What, it's what, meant to be humorous, just as you're meant to be humorous. Your, he's isn't your it? schoolmate. You've shown he's your cards. He's my schoolmate. Yeah. He is. You've shown your hand. I think no, he's a really good bloke. He's pretending it's not taking right. the piss out of Northerners. Yeah. He's saying, no, no, we're laughing at ourselves. Mm. Which is a load of cock, isn't it? Because we're not. We're going there to laugh at Northerners. Mm. And that's, that's, that's... And he's trying to pretend that it's something different. Other than that, you know, it's probably a very good film. Let's but, talk about George Osborne's Northern Powerhouse, let's though. Let's talk I mean, about it. What does it even they're mean, They're anyway? a great band. They were signed to Creation <laughs> Records in the mid-90s, <laughs> but they got a cover of The Enemy before their first single was out. They were running before they could oh. walk. He's made a big deal out of this Northern Powerhouse. I am not yeah. sure quite what he means by that, but it seems to me that they are being deprived of the same sort of funding as the southern areas are getting. Don't I don't really understand it. I, what I believe is there's a colossal rivalry, though, up north, isn't there? You would know about this, between various towns and other towns, and so the whole powerhouse united thing doesn't work. Is that right? No, it's, it's flawed. Little, there's a little flawed. bit of that. They're talking about all this transport infrastructure, but it's just trains to get people back to London mm. when they've been forced to go to the north for a day. Bloody hell! Do Had you to not go think the, north. the north should think about revolting? Because yeah. they're not getting enough money, right? They seem yeah. to be mugged off by the south and by the government. Yeah. And if I was a northerner, I'd be storming the palace gates, but yeah. they don't seem to do anything about it. Do you think they should become part of Scotland? Because they seem to be much more spiritually aligned with them. No, then the heroine would come in. Oh, oh come on, it's already oh, there. It's already there, isn't come it? Come on. No, 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 there's loads of booze and they're not getting their bloody fingers out and doing anything about it. They're rolling over. And, and letting You're everyone else You're going to start a fight, mate. Right? You were going to start a fight. Well, the thing is, they should come down here and start a revolution. Have you ever tried to catch the train and how expensive that is? No, I mean, do not get me started on privatising trains in this country. It is crazy. Thanks, panel. Coming up, school's out forever? Maybe. And our special guest is Alistair Campbell. Forever? Probably not. Good evening. My name is Jeremy Corbyn. I'm the leader of the Labour Party. That's right. I'm the fucking leader. Get used to it. That's why I'm answering the haters with my own official memoir. It's called Jeremy Corbyn, My Own Official Memoir. A great title for a great read. Remember, it wasn't just the lefty nutters like Skinner and Abbott who got me in. I was nominated by no less than party grandee Margaret Beckett. <laughs> Thanks for the nomination, Margaret, I called across the lobby. <laughs> Go fuck yourself, Jeremy, she hissed. <laughs> I shrugged it off, resolving to have her kneecapped round the back of the Winter Gardens Bournemouth at the next party conference. Cheeky tart. Welcome back. Now, I think it was Mr T who famously said, don't be a fool, stay in school. But that's easy for you to say, Mr T. <laughs> From the comfort of your luxury action transit in the 1980s LA underground, here in contemporary Britain, tens of thousands of children have failed to get into their first choice secondary school. Thousands didn't even get a place in their first six choices. So, shut your face, Mr T. You haven't got a grip on this issue in the slightest. You are the fool, and it's me that pities you. <laughs> <laughs> now, the papers have been full of education crisis stories this week, but no one seems to be panicking like we do about, say, cuts the NHS. But schools are much more important than hospitals. Schools are the very organs of social mobility. No wonder the Tories fucking hate them. That's why they're giving all the money to these mysterious, slightly sinister free schools. Unaccountable. Able to open wherever they want. Able to teach whatever they want. I wouldn't be surprised if Hogwarts wasn't a free school. What were their lessons on the dark arts, those creepy-looking house elves? and teachers without any apparent qualifications. These free schools get around £7,700 per pupil, whereas local authority schools get about £4,700 per pupil. Basically, the free schools are another way of taking money from local communities, giving it to the private sector. This makes the government's mates richer, whilst also making the poor stupider. And after all, uneducated people are far easier to control. I don't know, maybe it's time to just give up on stupid schools altogether. Let's play On The Other Hand. On the other hand. On one hand, people say school prepares you for the real world. But on the other hand, it's a lot harder than the real world. I mean, imagine someone drew a chalk penis 
on the back of your suit jacket when you were at work and you wore it out to lunch. You'd be a <laughs> fucking mess. But shit like that was all part of school life. On one hand, the private school sector is there for middle-class families who might currently be a drain on state resources. But on the other hand, some of us middle-class parents have different standards. I mean, if I was paying five grand a term, I wouldn't expect that money to include anal rape by one of the masters. But, you know, that's us plebs for you. On one hand, schools are about emotional support and social development too. But on the other hand, Zamo wouldn't have got on the smack if he was homeschooled, would he? On one hand, a good teacher can change a kid's life. On the other hand, for every Mrs McCluskey, you had a Mr Bronson. And he was such a cunt, he used to be Hitler in the Indiana Jones films. <laughs> uh, panel, is it a conspiracy? Do you think that the, the state education system's been chipped away at on purpose, Vanessa? No, I don't think it's a conspiracy. And I'm the mother of a teacher, the mother of a primary school teacher. And, right. uh, and, and, and therefore, you know, obviously not at all on the fence on this one. And I really think that uh, we ought to get much more excited, much more perturbed, much more alarmed, and really mm. go and chain ourselves to the railings or throw ourselves in front of the king's horse at the very least about all of this because it is desperately worrying and I do agree that these these free schools are deeply perplexing not to mention fake schools which are completely as far as I'm concerned bewildering and in fact loads of schools seem to be unfathomable particularly the ones sponsored by Carpet Right and other strange <laughs> you know businesses no. and corporations the mind you carpet fitting is a universal <laughs> skill that could earn us all a it's living a long term mate. not yeah. taught enough exactly it's not it's not, enough. It's it's not. not taught enough. Rob people do get their knickers in a twist very very quickly about cuts to the NHS and then you get the stories because like of the this, Labour party. this week it's because of my party apart from introducing all those liberal reforms in the 60s and 70s, which have made our nation sort of illiterate to the degree that they can hardly pronounce their own fucking names. Uh, <laughs> they, they also Nowadays, decided... Like some of those names are a bit funny. Well, they are, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. But, a lot of H's and K's in yeah. there. Yeah. But also, you know, they, they didn't fund it enough under the last Labour government either. But I don't mind the free schools. You don't? No, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see local authorities give the same amount of money to state schools, but I like the fact that free schools have broken free of that sort of... Uh, what are that, they? that sort of liberal yeah. consensus. So you like the principle of it? I like the principle it's, it's of it. It's yeah. funneling off funds. And... I, I prefer to send my kid to a free school than the Robert Mugabe comprehensive down the road. You right. Know? Yeah. What is a free school like? I you don't have to abide to the national curriculum. That's right. Outside the what? thing. What? Yeah. That is you not an it. education. You can teach them that no, dinosaurs didn't that. exist and all that stuff. Have a look and see who gets into universities. Mm. Free schools do. What do they take? Like, schools. I know about Montessori. Latin. Schools. Lots of Latin. Latin. Latin philosophy. Latin schools. Yeah. OK. Let's talk about um, uh, teachers. Uh, there's a shortage of them, of course. We hear that all the time. Is the money good? The Vanessa? money is poor. Yeah. Uh, you're supposed to be a teacher until you're at least 87 or something or other because you can never retire because you'll never be able to afford to because the goalposts have changed. There's a fuck of a lot of audit, so they have to spend the entire time accounting for the pieces of chalk that they've used. There are all sorts of ever-changing... OK, they don't use chalk, but they're ever-changing rules and regulations about what the latest phonics instruction has to be. The whole thing's just too much. The and it keeps changing, changing it, and though, changing. They, they've got no choice. What do they, do? <coughs> what do they love do? teaching? If they love teaching and they're good at it. They don't love teaching, they're just shit at everything else. No, that's <laughs> me. I'm sorry, but that is, it. That, that is it. You're true. sitting next to the me mother of a teacher. Yeah, that's she's so fucking shit as everything else I as well. I can't help you. Nonsense. I don't know. I've Nonsense. never met her. I'm sure she's lovely. Imagine how accomplished, accomplished, and accomplished. And wonderful. Imagine how accomplished a daughter of Vanessa felt. Right, thank be. you very Brilliant. much. Yeah. But that is a problem because they're paying so little now that you really are getting people like Vanessa Feltz's daughter in. What does that kids, mean? Is, I don't know. I mean, she's, it's she's, look at the education she system. She is passionate, she's gifted, she's beautiful, and she is shining a little light, a little don't stardust, don't. hang on, and a bit of illumination into the lives of children who are leading That's... pretty brutally deprived, nasty type of lives. So she is, yeah. she, well, is so she is, Miss like, Honey. She's Miss Honey, have you? Yes, oh, she's sorry. so weird, isn't he? Do I have to sit next to him? <laughs> he is weird. Is... And also, you can't see it. <laughs> I, I... Where is no it? No one can. Oh, yeah, of course God. you would. OK, good. Thanks very much, panel. Um, hey, guess what, everyone? It's time now for our special guest. The Mastermind. Behind not one, not two, but three Labour election wins. He's the book writing, marathon running, bagpipe playing, drink abstaining, spin doctoring, man who taught Tony Blair to act human. The real life Malcolm Tucker. It's Alistair Campbell.
Yes, that's right. Alistair Campbell joins us now on Newsteam. Welcome to the show, Alistair. Hello, sir. Are you happy to be here? I don't know yet. OK. Right, let's talk Europe. You've likened Brexit to Donald Trump, a bad international joke. No doubt, as far as you're concerned, then, we're best off in. Definitely. I mean, being part of the biggest single market in the world, it is a huge positive for us. And I think the, the out people, the Boris Johnsons and the Farages and the rest of them, I think they're living in a dream world. They keep saying that the, the in people aren't making a positive case. But I think the positive case is being made every day just by us being in the European Union and the good things that flow from that. The fact that a referendum is happening at all is a Cameron fuck-up, right? Yeah. I've written in there about Cameron's big problem is he's constantly confusing strategy and tactics, and I think that's what he's done in Europe. I don't think he ever particularly wanted to be in this position. And I think he got here because he was driven here by UKIP, and he was driven here by part of the press, and he just sort of... It, it got rid of the problem for then. Three years later, he's now having to have the, have the referendum, and our entire politics for the next year or two is going to be defined by it. And I do wish the Labour Party would get, you know, from Corbyn down, would get much more involved in the campaign. We need a slogan. What we need is okay. that stuff. What do you reckon? Come on, then. Um, I think in. In? In. Just in big it. poster saying in, in all over the country. In. I think that needs work. Uh, let's talk about Jeremy Corbyn. OK. Uh, you must be absolutely gutted about what he has done to a party. You work very hard, you're a key architect of making uh, new Labour and making the party electable after years in the wilderness. Um, and you've had to watch as it's been dragged back effectively to year zero. How do, does it make you feel when you sit there watching it all unravel so badly? Um, well, I can't say I'm enjoying it. But at the same time, I don't particularly want to become one of those people who just sort of pops up on television the whole time saying it was better in my day and Jeremy Corbyn's not up to it. You don't want to be Alan Hansen are. slagging off Brendan Rodgers? Uh, no, I wouldn't <laughs> mind being <laughs> Alan Hansen because he was on 40 grand a week for it, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, well, something like that. So, no, I don't... I just think it's... And I also think that it's too simple just to say he's terrible. Uh, I actually think he is onto something in terms of the public debate about this whole inequality thing. I think Ed Miliband was onto something there. But the thing I feel absolutely viscerally mm. is that having been involved, as you say, in the election campaigns that I was involved in, and having been a Labour supporter through a previous period when we kept losing elections, you have to win. Mm. And I don't, don't think you can win unless you're trusted on the economy, strong on security, and people look at your leader and think, I can see that guy in Downing Street. What does Tony think about Jeremy? Well, I'm sure that if you asked Tony to come on your programme, Sam, he'd be absolutely... You two haven't to... had a... You know, sat down, had a cup of tea and chatted over and just had a right good bitch-up about it. <laughs> no, not a bitch-up, but um, I, I suspect he feels pretty much like I do. In, in the end, you do have to decide. I mean, there's no point just sort of sitting around moaning about it. I literally do get stopped in the street all the time, not all the time, but regularly, mm. by people saying, what the hell is happening to the Labour Party? When are you going to get rid of him? Da, da, da. You get that all the time, OK? And you have to be realistic. He was elected. And he was elected by a very, very large margin. There's a real problem for the party. He's, he's widely viewed, as you've made clear, as unelectable. But within the system on which he's elected, he's pretty unassailable. Mm. And unelectable and unassailable is a very dangerous com combination in a, in a political party that wants to win power. As you say, you've written this wonderful book Marvel. about leaders, winners. Um, you know the only two people are in the book, but not on the cover? Who? Lance Armstrong and Vladimir Putin. Really? Yeah. And why did you omit them from the cover? I thought Lance, it, people wouldn't understand. Yeah. Uh, and I thought Putin, um, jury out on whether force for good or bad. But I do say, I do say in there, though, about Putin. Yeah. Because I've got this thing that, that, that if you want to win big, bold things, you have to be very clear about your objective, very clear about your strategy, and only then think about the tactics. And the thing about Putin, he is the only leader I can think of whose objective, strategy and tactics are totally aligned. Mm. His objective is the reassertion of Russian power, his strategy is the reassertion of Russian power, and his tactics are all about the reassertion of Russian power, of which, by the way, this channel is one. 
But um, so you're just but a pawn in his. In is that his, what his you think? Well, listen, no, really. there is a lot of information and misinformation that flies around about all these people, whether it be Putin, whether it be Corbyn, whether it be your old boss, Tony Blair, who is always in the People say all sorts about they him, do, all sorts do. of far fetched stuff. It must be frustrated. <laughs> For you, frustrating for you to hear stuff that you just think, well, that, that just never happens. Come so, on, then, throw you, it out of we'll me. Throw it out of me. We'll do you the <laughs> honour now, the favour, just okay. for your sake and Tony's, not just for our own entertainment. Because he'll, he'll be watching. We'd like to help you sift the bullshit okay. from um, okay. the facts okay. with a little game that we like to call Is This Stuff About Tony Blair True <laughs> or Lies Made Up to Sell Crap Books? <laughs> Is this stuff about Blair true or lies made up to sell crap books? This from my books, I'm going to be really, really angry with you. But well, anyway, see if on. you can spot it. You okay. not, I won't reveal right. my sources. OK. OK, uh, well, you can see if any of this is from your book. Uh, okay. We'll go through these, just tell us whether it's true or false. Uh, you once entered Downing Street to find Tony Blair clad only in yellow and green underpants. How many prime ministers have a body like this, he asked. The preen in Blair's he is described in this source. True. True? True. How did you feel? Uncomfortable uh, or aroused? Not aroused, no, no. Um, overdressed is he, how I felt. he is in good shape, though. Or at least he was. I haven't seen him for a while. But, I mean, you know, he used to get Torso of the Month in Heat magazine. Yeah, he once got Torso of the Month. Yeah, but it's it a did. bit better than any other prime minister. Yeah, but used to suggest, like, an ongoing oh, he's thing. he's let it go to you. You bitch. No, 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 no. You <laughs> bitch. Your mate. And now you're like, oh, he's... Uh, she's, no, no. He, she's, he, not as, she's not as fit as she used to be. He still works out every day, I think. Yeah. Uh, OK, next one. Blair once boasted that he could shag Cherie at least five times a night. Uh, made up to sell crap newspapers. Right. Uh, Blair was so useless around the house that he once tried to use a brush to sweep up honey. I uh, don't know. Not in my diaries. <laughs> Could you imagine such a thing? Uh, yeah. He was not domestically skilled. Not massively, no. Um, after winning the second election, the Blairs went for a rebirth in experience in Mexico where they covered themselves with mud and watermelons and screamed loudly to signal the pain of birth. Uh, I think that was crap to sell a book. Not in the diary. You weren't there. I wasn't there. Mexico, so That's true. Know. Can you That's confirm true. they were in Mexico? You don't know what they were actually doing there. <laughs> I think I could, they were in Mexico yeah. at a certain point in that year, and I wasn't there. That's true. All right, well, we'll draw our own conclusions. OK, yeah. Uh, Blair regarded Gordon Brown as an unbalanced sociopath, and Sherry hated him so much that she refused to let him in the flat. Um, is that Robert Peston's book? I'm not revealing my sources. Um, no, no. I don't think he went in the flat very much. No. Uh, but wouldn't let. And, and I think Tony sometimes worries. You're, 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 you're talking in legalese now. You're asking me to define my terms. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm slightly worried. Was, okay. If that was from the diaries, I can't deny it, can I? Uh, Blair had to get a new bed shipped in on his first day in Down Street because the previous one stunk of Ken Clark. Is it stunk or stank? Stunk. Stunk, of, stunk, stunk. of Ken Clark. Uh, I do remember they got a... No, I think it was more he said he didn't particularly want to sleep in Ken Clark's bed. What it wasn't does, the smell. What does Ken Clark stink of? Probably... Was he smoking back then? He did those cigarellos, didn't he? Yeah, cigarellos and battered fish. Mm. And real ale. Yeah. Alistair Campbell, have you enjoyed your appearance on Sam Saturday News? absolutely loved it. I yeah, had well, no idea what it was going to be like. Yeah, I uh, can see you've enjoyed every moment and it's been lovely to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. That's it for tonight. Thanks to Alistair Campbell and, of course, our panel, Felicity Ward, Rod Liddell and Vanessa Feltz. It's been another full and frank discussion of the issues again tonight. I hope you've agreed with all of them. And remember, if you haven't, you're just a stupid racist. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>